Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed your tea break. I hope you made yourself a great tea and scones or whatever you did at home. Uh, we're going to move on to our business and government driving innovation panel. We've got a great uh, panel of people here. And once again, as, is, as before, you can put questions in and they'll be sent through to me for the Q&A section at the end after everyone's talked. So as the questions come in, send them in and we'll try to deal with as many of those as we can. Uh, I would first like to introduce uh, Peter Millich, the Innovation Connections Facilitator at the CSIRO. Peter has a broad multi-sector experience in industrial biotechnology, food manufacturing, biopharmaceuticals, tech transfer commercialization in, in private and public sector organizations. Since 2015, Peter has delivered the Innovations Connections programs in partnership with Oz Industry, servicing the Sydney and Central West New South Wales. So please welcome to the stage, Peter Millich. Uh, thank you, uh, Craig, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the, some grant funding schemes uh, available to startups, SMEs, to enable collaboration uh, so you can develop uh, wonderful products and services. Also, I want, I want to touch on a few examples of uh, companies that have leveraged these schemes that are working in the circular economy. And then I just want to touch on uh, what CIRO is doing in the uh, circular economy space, and there's lots to, to cover there. So. Um, the Innovation Connections program is, is uh, actually funded out of federal government, out of Oz Industry, uh, but CSIRO uh, is the national delivery partner of that program. So um, what we do in this team, I'm a part of a team called SME Connect, we deliver all those three programs. Uh, uh, the two other programs I should mention is uh, uh, Kickstart that, and also STEM Plus Business, the two separate uh, funding opportunities um, that come out of CSIRO. Um, every year, uh, we, de uh, we deliver about 350 grants, so we do a lot of work, uh, we're quite busy, um, and that funds a total of about $30 million worth of uh, research activity. Um, and this, this slide here uh, gives you an idea of the uh, schemes available. Uh, so CSRO Kickstart is available to uh, um, startup companies. So if you're a small company with less than $1.5 million in turnover, you can avail yourself of the CSIRO Kickstart grant. It's a matching grant, so there's dollar for dollar matching. Um, and that will fund projects lasting up to one year. Um, in that particular program, the, the uh, only possibility is to work with CSIRO collaborators. Um, if you're an SME, you've been around for at least three years, have a turnover or operating expenditure of at least $1.5 million, you can leverage uh, the Innovation Connections program. Now that provides up to $130,000 in matched funding. And uh, in that program, you can collaborate with any uh, Australian publicly funded research organization. Uh, and there are about 40 of those around the country. Um, and then beyond that, if uh, there's still some more work to do, and if you've successfully completed an Innovation Connections program, um, you can apply for what's called STEM Business Plus. And that makes available up to $115,000 in matched funding for up to three years. So you can see if you're a bit strategic about, these, uh, about your innovation journey, you can leverage quite a bit of uh, support from, from government and from CSIRO. A little bit more detail about innovation connections. Um, so there are three options with that $130,000 in, in funding. Um, the first one is called a researcher placement grant. So that's where a company wants to collaborate with the university researcher. So for example, if you want to work with Veena, uh, Veena's group at, the, at UNSW in the Smart Centre, uh, the company can contribute up to $50,000, which is matched by government, and that's to enable a $100,000 piece of work, if you like. The second option there is for a company uh, employee, that's a business researcher to be, to be supported to work on a project. But again, this business researcher needs to collaborate to some degree with a, a university or CSIRO. And that can take the form of getting, having some testing done or using a facility within those organisations. Uh, last of all, there's a um, $30,000 grant available to the company to employ a recent graduate. So that can be a bachelor, someone with a bachelor's, master's or PhD. And they can be supported to work on, on an in-house company project. Okay. 
Um, so we partner with all universities around Australia, all the research intensive universities obviously are the most uh, popular partners, if you like, but uh, in, in, any uh, university or research organisation or institute is, is potentially eligible for this program. And um, just on some of the outcomes, so you can see on this slide here that uh, the vast majority of businesses who collaborate or participate in this uh, program are either very satisfied with the outcomes. Uh, and, and very importantly, I think 86% uh, 80, of businesses who had never worked with universities or the public uh, research sector said they have developed this ongoing relationship, which is a key, for me, a key metric of this program. And that, that uh, you know, uh, is just to encourage that continual collaboration. Um, and in, in terms of the graduate option, um, the vast majority of graduates are offered ongoing full-time employment. So again, some, some really nice outcomes. Um, now, I just want to uh, mention some of the uh, uh, projects that we've uh, funded. Um, there's been quite a bit in the food, re food waste area. So, um, for example, there's a company called Brennan Recycles, which uh, is, has collaborated with uh, CSIRO's uh, uh, food and agricultural uh, researchers to, to work on management of uh, fruit and vegetable waste. Uh, and they're looking to develop an animal feed. In fact, they're looking to, to reduce the fruit fly infestation in food waste uh, and then develop this animal feed. Uh, interestingly, also, there's another company called Gotera uh, who are also collaborating with CSIRO and they're actually taking the opposite tack where they're trying to produce uh, many, or, or breed uh, black soldier flies on food waste. So the idea is that there is they harness the protein, that protein acts as an animal feed. Uh, a third company, a third example of, of that is um, a company called Food Recycle. Uh, uh, and they're looking to uh, take uh, food waste streams and develop commercial scale uh, aquafeed. Uh, so again, some, some really nice work happening there. Some of my clients uh, are looking at developing sustainable compostable packaging um, from natural fibres, from, from sugar cane waste, for example. And that's been driven, driven a lot by consumer sentiment. So they're coming to me saying our, our customers are wanting this, so how can we do this? Um, I have another client that's looking to extract uh, plastic PET plastic from, uh, from waste streams. If, if they can developing some smart chemistry with Queensland University of Technology, if you can do that, if you can concentrate this high value plastic, then that can you know, add uh, extra value and, and you know, lead to a commercial process. Um, have a couple of companies as well looking at um, the, in, uh, sustainable concrete manufacture. So as we know, concrete is a very um, uh, CO2 intensive uh, product um, and there's several looking to develop green con concrete, for example. Uh, what one example of that is where they try and incorporate, incorporate waste glass streams into the concrete manufacture. Uh, uh, last of all, I just want to touch on um, CSIRO's um, the work in, uh, in, in the circular economy. Uh, so there are programs in uh, ending plastic waste, for example, circular food and agriculture. So Craig can attest to that uh, example of the seaweed production up at Bribey Island where they're looking to incorporate seaweed, seaweed into animal feed. Um, digital innovation, uh, and that's about productive, uh, preventative uh, uh, maintenance and automation. Sustainable mining and mineral processing. So looking at uh, non-toxic ways to extract gold, for example. Looking at green metal manufacturing processes and how to clean up waste streams. In the energy space, Zorro is working in efficient grids, in, in uh, hydrogen economy, of course. Um, thermal and solar PV and low emissions technologies are being looked at. In water resource management, um, it's about characterising what resources are available in Australia and how to efficiently use those resources and, and also uh, building up an informatics uh, database. Other work is looking at resilient cities, um, looking at um, urban edge development, green infrastructure, for example. And, and finally, uh, there's some work happening in the lithium battery recycling. So how, how do we develop a domestic recycling industry and, and looking at new materials and uh, recovering those uh, materials? I might just leave it there. Um, if you want further information on, it, on these grant schemes, just uh, 
I've, since I've left there some, uh, some contact details and you're more than welcome to contact me as well if you want further information. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I love his speech that not only uh, gives a lot of solutions, tells you how many solutions there are out there, but also offers you money as well, um, Peter. That's, you've hit all the top things there. Uh, by the way, if you want to join the conversation on Twitter or Instagram or, or Snapchat, if you can figure that out, uh, the hashtag is hashtag innovations numeral four and then CE for circular economy. So innovations for CE, hashtag innovations for CE if you want to get involved. And remember also you can put your questions in and we'll pass them on in the next session. I'd like to introduce our next guest, uh, Monica Richter, the Senior Manager of Low Carbon Futures at WWF. Uh, Monica is an economist and social ecologist interested in the role of business in accelerating the uptake of low and zero carbon solutions. And boy, do we need that. Uh, her recent career highlights include establishing the Business Renewable Centre Australia, uh, a community of practice for companies setting science-based long-term emissions reduction targets, and recently collaborating with the New South Wales State Government and Lendlease to launch reports on the need to tackle embodied carbon in the building and construction industry. So please welcome uh, to the microphone, Monica. Thank you, Craig. All right, let's get the show on the road. There we are. All right. Um, good. -o. So as a social ecologist, I'm really interested in systems thinking and how we change systems. So thinking about hard systems as well as soft systems. So today I'm going to give you some examples of um, programs that I run where we have to emphasise the importance of social norming, collaboration, we've heard a lot about that today, capacity building, the importance of carrots and sticks, but also approaching opportunities with scale in mind, because that's the problems that we're facing today, they all require scale. So here we have a chart that shows where emissions are heading to in the climate world, with all the historic, but also the, com the commitments that are on the, on the table currently from global governments. And we know that if we're going to get to a path of 1.5 or even well below two, the science says we need to halve emissions in this decade. So it's a 50% reduction in emissions. So that's 5% per annum over that decade globally we need to reduce. That's the scale of the challenge we face. Now, what did we hear recently? China, 23% of global emissions is um, China's responsibility. They've committed to net zero before 2060. They've committed to um, peak their emissions by 2030. I mean, that is a significant challenge for a, for a country where we've outsourced most of our manufacturing to. The European Union, another big 15 to 20% of global emissions. They've made a commitment to 55% to reduction in emissions by 2030. So you know, again, that you can see the scale of the challenge, but also countries stepping up to those opportunities. We've heard a lot about the sustainable development goals today. We also need to be thinking all of the social equity issues that come along with some of the ecological challenges and around the circular economy as well. So I won't dwell into that. So this slide here shows two pictures. Fifth Avenue, 1900, imagine horse and cart, every single horse and cart going along uh, Fifth Avenue except one, the Model T Ford is burning along, trying to weave its way through. And then on the other side, is a picture 13 years later. There's only one horse and cart and they're all Model T Ford. So that's the opportunity and the possibility that we, we face and we've seen it happen with COVID. The in innovation is possible. So I run a program called the Science Based Targets Initiative here in Australia. It's a global program with a number of partners and it gets companies, biggest companies with the biggest footprint to set science-based Paris Agreement aligned emission reductions for their scope one, scope two, so their internal emissions, but also their value chain emissions around scope three. And in Australia, we have 25 companies that have set science-based, formally committed to set science-based targets. There are many more that um, are doing it informally. And over the last few months, we've seen two ASX top 20 companies make that commitment and set targets, so Woolworths, and transurban. So, you know, thinking again, you've got transurban major manufacturers, builders of our motorways across the eastern seaboard, and Woolworths, 
one of our big uh, retailers. So they're setting science based targets. They're going to be driving that through their supply chain. So the opportunities for you know, members of, of GECA and other organisations to jump on the bandwagon and help Woolworths to deliver that is really important. And of course, a lot of companies are also making commitments around net zero by 2050. So it's uh, also, we're seeing Qantas, we're seeing you know, BP, many, many com companies are making those kinds of commitments and they're going to be delivering that. Just one example of a company here in Australia, Investor was the first property company in Australia to set a science-based target. So they didn't have access to their tenant data. So one of the innovations they needed to do was to, start to negotiate with their big tenants to give them access to their electricity um, contracts so that they knew how much uh, they could, they, the, the, their tenants' uh, electricity consumption was so that they could start to work together, tenants and, bu and building owners, to, to manage the emissions forward. So that's, the, that's that example of collaboration. So the other program I run is the Business Renewable Centre, my project director there, and it helps companies and councils to commit to long-term, large-scale power purchase agreements for renewables. Uh, you know, traditionally, companies would be buying their electricity in the retail electricity market, three or five-year contracts. So these are long-term contracts. You need to commit those long-term contracts because you need to provide financial certainty. So we've seen in 2016, there, were no, there was no such thing as a power purchase agreement in Australia for renewables. And now we've got in 2020, 80 power purchase agreements, five gigawatts of renewables, and you know, a lot of really good examples and a lot of really good examples of companies making those commitments. We've also got a number of companies that have made commitments to RE100. 100% of their renewable electricity comes, of their electricity comes from renewable energy sources by 2025 or, or 2030. All the major banks have made those commitments. We've got some data center companies and many more. So just another example, we've got the opportunity through the um, post COVID, I guess, uh, to look at greening the economy through investments in you know, the batteries, investments in building electric buses. We build buses in this country. We could make them electric, imagine that. Um, solar, we have one of the highest, we have the highest penetration of solar, of, of uh, rooftop solar in the world. We're 20% um, you know, of households now have uh, that. We could be doing much more than that. And of course, the hydrogen economy, the green hydrogen economy are those opportunities. So speaking of other innovations and embodied carbon. So embodied carbon is the upfront carbon. It's the steel, the cement, the aluminium that go into building our motorways, our roads, our rail, and the buildings that we live in and buildings that we go to, to work in. And the steel and cement industry alone produces somewhere in the order of 14% of global emissions. So even if we could tackle that amount of emissions and reduce it to near zero over the next 10 years, that would be a significant service uh, to, to the globe. So that's one of the projects that we're just starting to kick off now. And it is an ecosystem. It's a big challenge. It's, it's not linear, it's going to require a significant amount of collaboration, but I think we can do it. And a lot of companies are coming to the table and saying, yes, we, we want to be part of the solution. So before I finish one final uh, program we're involved in with the New South Wales Government Sustainability Advantage Program. So there are a lot of wonderful companies, startups, innovators, who want to drive change. And we've launched with Sustainability Advantage, Panda Labs, our program for getting these startups to be curated, to scale them up for impact and scale up to be ready to be invest invested. So I believe together we can turn the tide. And as I said, we need to experiment, we need to collaborate, we need to approach opportunities with scale in mind, we need to build our capacity and we need to have the carrots and sticks, but also that social norming that's going to come to that. So thanks very much for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Monica. Yes, I totally agree. We need carrot and sticks. I think we need a few more sticks occasionally in Australia, I've got to say. Carrots are good though. It's interesting how many people I've spoken to who, you know, councils of that have gone into power purchase agreements and 
you know, gone into it for an environmental reason and ended up saving a lot of money as well, so it's great to see. Uh, but we can't just rely on those carrots. Uh, I, I want to introduce next uh, Zoe Baker, the Program Manager for City Switch uh, from the City of Sydney. Zoe is the Program Manager and she brings a background in social research, strategy and community development to the problems and opportunities of corporate sustainability. The program hits a sweet spot of her interest in how environmental social change can be achieved through engagement, aspiration, inspiration and measurement, transparency and norming and it is a, it's a really interesting program so I look forward to hearing from Zoe. Thank you very much. Delighted to follow Monica Richter anytime on a stage because she says half the stuff that I would love to say so I can keep it nice and short. Thank you very much. Um, look, I'm super excited to be here today and to have so many people logging on online. This is the strangest room I've ever presented to, but it's the new world. Um, so, that's me. Um, the circular economy is such a massive thing. There's so many amazing things that we've heard over today and we will continue to hear. So I'm going to try and keep really in my lane for what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, the problem with circular economy is this really complex, interdependent ecosystem of uh, things that need to happen. But the opportunity is that it's a really complex, interdependent ecosystem where lots of things need to happen. That is exciting. Um, this session is talking about business and government um, kind of in driving innovation and uh, as Craig said in the intro, that's great for me because I actually sit at that nexus. I run a government program, a government sustainability program for business. Perfect. Um, and as Councillor uh, Miller mentioned a bit earlier, that for City of Sydney, um, when you look at the waste that happens across the city, we're actually only managing about 10% of that waste. So that leaves this huge extra area where we need to collaborate all of these things that we've heard from other presenters. We need to work with the people who are doing the, the other 90% of the waste within the LGA. Um, so we do take an approach then saying, well, what, 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 who's creating this waste? Where does it come from? Where does it go? Um, and here's a bit of a breakdown. These are 2006 numbers from our waste strategy. Uh, we love a bit of policy and strategy. Do check out City of Sydney website if you want to have a look at how we are approaching these things. I'm going to talk specifically about that government program and engagement space because when you look at this, you see, well, there are sectors in our community who we really need to come together, get in the room with and talk to. Um, the exciting thing when you look at that, I mean, waste, I'm obviously, we're everyone who's listening, we're waste nerds, we're really excited about it. Um, when I look at a graph like that, it is representing tons of waste, but you can also look at that as representing people. And I think that is a really important thing for us to understand that, you know, people have said, oh, well, you know, commercial office buildings would run perfectly if nobody was in them, but that's not what buildings are for, that's not what businesses do, that's not what cities do. We are people, we, we are gonna generate waste, we are going to need to take a sort of people-centric approach to this alongside, as I said earlier in that ecosystem, all of the technical solutions and other things that happen. So I'm gonna, as I said, stay in the lane and talk about what the city does to engage our people. Um, and we run a range of programs. The government, we love a program. Um, we're looking at those sectors, residents, office businesses, and other businesses. <laughs> um, and we've got a range of different programs. I'm not going to go super into detail um, into the sort of how each of those run, but please check out the programs. Um, you can see on the slide that in, within each of those sectors, there's actually such a range of different people you need to engage. So we do, we do run those programs, some of them are membership programs, some of them just engagement and kind of promotion programs, sharing information. We run events, we run workshops, we have grants, we do building manager training, very important produce a whole bunch of sort of guides and toolkits. And we've got some stuff that we've worked with, with Gekka, best practice guides pick up toolkits that a business or, a, or an individual can kind of take posters and put that up to really uh, speak in that people-centric space. So this is, this is kind of what we do. Um, and 
that if we're talking about drivers, we're not, you know, at that, going back to that carrot and stick, we're not talking about legislation or kind of mechanisms to force people to do stuff here. This does have to be bringing organisations, bringing building managers and people along on the journey. Um, what we really push people to do is develop their own strategies, develop policy, develop targets, look at those eco labels and other standards and systems that you can join up to, join RE100, commit to carbon neutral, because once you've kind of got an overarching goal in a place that you want to be, and we have those for the city as well, um, then you're in a model of, well, how are we going to measure that? How are we going to manage that? And that is the basis of sustainability outcome. If we don't measure it, we can't manage it. That's super important. There's lots of ways to manage um, waste and circular economy and carbon impact. Uh, we do encourage people to do reporting, whether that's to us as our leadership programs or to other bodies. Um, and, and the really important part of that is when we're talking about all these different people doing good, that's amazing. We really want to keep a focus on that collective impact. And so that means not just um, counting that and, and talking about the impacts that the whole cohort has had, but also being able to work together to find better solutions um, and, and get there faster together. The other important thing that we like to do at the city is tell those stories. and that's really important for people to be able to see that there's flags on the hill. I can follow those other organisations or other people and find similar solutions. Um, and it goes back to that norm setting. We, we need to set norms. We need people who are reaching beyond what's currently possible and finding new ways of doing stuff. Um, the exciting thing when you're talking, when we're talking about circular economy is that being that ecosystem, if you start thinking in that systems thinking, you're not just finding the currently possible solution to a problem, but you're trying to work out what are all of the steps in that circle. And what that does is flush out where those gaps are and where the squeaky wheels and the things that don't quite join up yet in that circular economy are. Um, that's an exciting space that we want to work in as well. Um, and, and that's where things like the CSIRO grants and other um, incubators and people who, who are really trying to foster those gaps are an awesome opportunity. Um, so we, and the call to action, I guess, um, to wrap up at my zero uh, is get involved. Come and join one of our leadership programs or our networks or our working groups get in touch with us, the City of Sydney and lots of other councils around Australia. We are there, we do want to support you in, in the goals that you want to achieve. Um, and if you are in the industry and you have a solution that you think might fill one of those gaps, come to us, whether we've got a grant or the EPAs have a grant or CSIRO, or there's some other way that we can help incubate that. That is such an important um, element that we all need to do. So. Uh, join us, come into the room. The other really big opportunity there that I'd just like to close on is that there is a triple bottom line when we start talking about circular economy. We can talk about that sustainability outcome. Um, obviously, we want economic impacts and, and circular economy is a massive growth area that's jobs and industry growth that's really exciting. Um, but we can also look for some of the social impacts in there as well. And that's a great opportunity and, um, and a really human centered to go back to that people um, message. We wanna see those solutions that, that make the world better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. I enjoy another waste nerd being here. Um, and it's true, it's a, a lot of stuff has been led through councils. So getting in touch with your local council and city city particularly has a bit, few more resources to actually be able to achieve some amazing things. Um, I'd like to welcome our next guest here. Uh, Pooja Rao is a director of Luxby Furniture. Uh, she's worked there for the last eight years. And Pooja is, has a keen interest in ensuring that the company grows within a framework that has the environment in the forefront of all decision making. Uh, please welcome Welcome to Pooja. Hello, and um, thank you for letting us be involved. Um, right. Customizable, local, sustainable. These are the three core values of Lakshmi. 
We produce contract furniture in an environmentally sustainable way with 95% of our inputs locally sourced in Australia. Unlike traditional furniture manufacturers who would use a large amount of human labor to produce every piece of furniture, we harness the power of seven large CNC machines in a 65,000 meter squared facility to replicate the human touch and let us produce more product with a consistent finish. We specialize in manufacturing furniture for the commercial environment, which could be offices, universities, schools, or public spaces. We build furniture to last. However, a lot of commercial furniture ends up in landfill. In the office furniture market alone, every 1,000 square meters of office space cleared contributes 53 tons of waste. Office furniture is the least recycled product, despite a lot of the material used within office furniture being recyclable or reusable. There are several reasons for this. First of all, the furniture made is not made from recycled material or is made from environmentally harmful materials, such as formaldehyde. The other issue is that the contractor used to make good on the premises may not be aware that the furniture can be recycled or that take back facilities occur. We need to provide incentives for manufacturers to build furniture with recycled product and also make it easy for the product to be recycled at the end of its life cycle. GECA, as an accreditation body, does work with industry to show the advantages of using environmentally sustainable furniture, but we need all actors in the supply chain to be on board with this. An easy way to increase incentives to manufacturers would be for quantity surveyors to provide credits to locally manufactured environmentally conscious furniture and to provide demerits to imported furniture made with environmentally harmful inputs. By using local manufacturers, a take back product at the end of the life cycle would be easy with the product being sent directly to the manufacturer for reuse. The truth is that furniture procurement and disposal are not done by the same companies. But at the end, we need to show the impact of the decision to the end users and show the impact they are having by procuring non-recyclable or non-local furniture. We need a whole of industry approach. This is critical. By providing real incentives to manufacturers, you'll increase resources to recycle product and ensure that more products will be taken back at the end of their life and recycled. There is definitely a cost to recycle and the industry must understand these costs and realize that the costs will be on par or lower than the cost of putting the products into landfill. At Luxme, we understand that not all furniture can be repurposed or reused. The only way to increase the amount of product recycled is to make it easier. And this is why we are releasing Luxboard to the market. Luxboard is a completely recycled particle board that can be used on workstation, table or joinery surfaces. We are producing a product with an infinity life cycle that will be continuously reused and recycled. To illustrate this, we just show this infinity life cycle of the product. So the board is first manufactured, delivered to site for installation, then used for five to seven years, after which it is collected, sent to us where we will recycle it. When it is recycled, the board will be chipped, refined, and then produce new particle board. The cycle is continuous and self-feeding. Every 100 tops made from Lux board will reduce one tree required in production. Once these tops are then recycled at the end of their life, another three quarters of a tree will be saved. Once these recycled tops are then recycled, another half a tree will be saved from production. And once these recycled tops are recycled, another quarter of a tree will be saved from production. In its lifetime, those 100 tops will save two and a half trees required in production. The same amount of output is being produced, but with less trees required. This is our aim to continuously reuse existing product and produce new product with existing recycled product. This fulfills the aim of being a truly sustainable manufacturer. Finally, I just wanna highlight how Gecka has helped open our eyes to recycle our products through their take back clause. Gecka has pushed us to open our eyes to find ways to recycle our product. And I just wanna show you the ways two of our products can be recycled. So in this diagram, we just show um, a table product and an upholstered product. So with the table, the top is made in Lux board and this will be recycled. The metal can be melted down. The legs can be made into wood chip. 
the metal glides can be reused. And with the upholstered lounge, the foam in the lounge will go back to the foam manufacturer to be recycled, the fabric can be recycled, the metal can be recycled, and again, the glides will be reused. A big thank you to Gekka for supporting us on this journey, and we hope the whole industry gets behind this and understands that we need sustainability principles at the forefront of our minds when procuring furniture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pooja. Uh, we're running a little bit behind, but a couple of quick questions uh, before we go into our next panel. For Peter, does the startup have to solely operate in Australia or can a startup with overseas operations alongside local operations also apply for a Kickstart grant? Yes. Yes, it can be, even if you're overseas a little bit as well? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, it's good news for whoever's out there wants that. Pooja, a quick question for you as well. Do you think there are enough incentives in place at the moment to support businesses like yourself that are trying to take the right approach you know, to actually move towards the circular economy or is it really you're having to motivate yourself at this point? I think it's really interesting. As manufacturers, what we do is we get raw input to produce into finished product. Essentially, if we use less input to produce a finished product, we make more money. So in my head, I don't understand why sustainability is not pushed more. Like very briefly, one of the reasons we use so much machinery in our process is it actually results in um, optimization of resources used. So it makes a lot of sense for me to be more sustainable which results in less waste. Less waste is obviously less money used in the disposal. So yeah, for me, being a manufacturer, I don't think we need more government grants. Obviously, if you want to give them, I'll accept them. <laughs> um, but um, I think there's already enough in place with the market that we should pursue it. I guess it's something that this is the incentive there for you to use less material in the first place. Is there the incentive at the end process for the to be reused in that, that's where. No, and I think that's a really good point. So one of the issues that we have is the high amount of labor required in the take back scheme. So for the product to actually be recycled, we have to do another process. Mm. That does cost a bit of money. But again, if we put our minds to it and if people get behind it, then we're business people, we'll figure out a way to make money from it. <laughs> Excellent. Look at this, business people that don't want more money. It's wonderful to see. <laughs> thank you to all of our panelists here. And uh, thank you for all of you. We've, I'm sure there's more questions coming through, which hopefully our panel will be able to respond to maybe on social media or otherwise. Thanks to you uh, once again to Peter, Monica, Zoe and Pooja. Please round of applause.